13 through to 17, where she found herself. And um, it was a 55,000 word story, which is yet to be given the final edit. It's still in a, in a, in a cupboard somewhere, and but I will eventually. Um, I called that one Blackbirds and Butterflies. And then I found that I had something that's been knocking at me for a long time, in fact, for years, and it kept coming back. I had to do this. I had to write this story. I've done memoir courses with Patty Miller, three of them, back in 2004 to 2010, and I also placed all this in a drawer, as I do. Then I attended a seminar in Gosford after I'd written the Blackbirds and Butterflies, and this feeling was still inside me. Oh, the woman speaker who spoke said, if you have an insistent subject, something that just won't go away, God is calling you to do it. And I fainted, fainted, landed up on the floor. So Kathy's novel, novel writing 12 month course began in January, 2020, and I enrolled. And you've got to have 20,000 words of a novel to submit. I had nothing. All I had was all my notes in drawers and things like that. And yet I knew I had to write about this and I had no idea how to do it. Single Burnt Mountain is the result of that course. Finished during lockdown, getting up at 3.30 in the morning and writing in the quiet until about six or seven in the morning before my husband got up because he's got dementia. And I decided to write it for myself, um, basically. Um, first I tried it as a novel and it didn't gel. So I found I had to be true. I had to write my own story, the story of searching for the healing of my mother who had her first breakdown when I was 11 years of age. And probably using notes, um, throughout my life, this dominated our family, mum's breakdown, and um, it was never talked about. It was something that was hidden, a mystery to me, what had made her a perfectly normal mother that I remembered to somebody who was disappearing, only to return again months later as if she'd gone away on a holiday. I tell the story of how it affected us, the huge changes as my family, as my father began thinking that the next place and the next situation was going to make her better. And she was a singer. She, this first breakdown she had with four little children under, well, I was nearly not quite 11. And four little kids, one still a baby and 37 railway fettlers in a hotel to look after. And she wasn't sleeping. So that was why she had it. So dad kept changing us and moving us from place to place. It was like the magic faraway tree. We kept moving and it was always different, always exciting, always new. And we lived in two shops, two hotels, two funeral parlours, a home for delinquents, a chook farm, and a variety of North Shore suburban houses because dad always bought good homes. We always had good food. We appeared to be the essence of North Shore middle class. And... <laughs> Underneath was this angst going on all the time, I suppose. Well, maybe I was the one that had the angst more than anyone else. So I begin, I decided I'd start from tracing the family and tracing the uh, attitudes of World War II, um, because I'm old and I was a baby then. And um, I tell of those war years where my mother and I sang for the ladies in their fox furs with their husbands away at war and of troop trains and soldiers. And it spans from World War II through the next 70 years. The first part tells the family story and the second part tells my adult years. Visiting what to me was quite terrifying, Bladesville Mental Hospital. I challenged the psychiatrist there and uh, I took my mother for exorcism and that turned out to be a very funny day. And uh, I visited her at Cumberland Hospital in Parramatta, where she lived in one of the little cottages that was later bulldozed to build the new children's hospital. And I began to see, as I pondered what to tell you, that this book wasn't just about my life and my mother's. It was the story of vulnerable people, broken people, people who can never speak for themselves. And I thought that I'd read you a short chapter on how the patients reacted 
to the Richmond report, knowing that they were going to be moved. And these were the first of the patients to be moved back into society and expected to cope with life once again. Hmm? No, it's not very long. No. So I called this bit Dory Song. It was unusual quiet that day at Willow Cottage. Nothing but a low moan coming from her old woman in a ragged violet cardigan, rocking back and forth as she cuddles and kisses the cellular face of a life-size doll in her arms. A man sits by a silent radio, his head drooping onto the rough weave of the egg-stained lapels of a grey wool coat. A couple sit holding hands, the pink leather lounge showing smudges of wet stain flopping from the cheeks of the wet fat woman in her short purple taffeta dress. Her friend touches her cheeks, pats, pats her gently, his fingers running to her mouth, running vainly to push up and down on the downturned lips. He jerks as if in sudden inspiration and reaches into his trouser pocket for a crumpled handkerchief, shakes it out, folds it in two and wipes her face dry. You're a lovely man, Nicky, a true gentleman. She rubs her eyes with the back of her hand, the red nail polish contrasting with the blonde hair. I can't help but love you, Dory. We're meant to find each other. But now, he balls up the wet handkerchief and stuffs it back into his pocket, jumps to his feet, pacing back and forth on the carpet square, wringing his hands. Evie in the mauve cardigan blinks back tears, enfolding the doll so that it bulges, a mauve wool phantom pregnancy with nothing but the celluloid feet showing. I sit in the nearest chair to her and pat her knee. It's a week since my last visit. Normally the residents meet me at the front door, afternoon tea already with freshly cooked cake and six white kitchen cups and saucers and plates set on a lace tablecloth that Dory has bought in one of her shopping trips. They told us where to go, Eve Stips. They came yesterday and told us our cottages to be bulldozed. They're sending me to ride me. I've been, I've been here since I was 14. They said I'd never manage outside, said I couldn't come back to see Jarrett. That little girl that won't know it, but that I've gone. I've ordered this doll to keep her company. Now, Jarrett was, had Down syndrome, and she lived across the paddock in Ward 14, a red brick building with an enclosed long veranda within the main section of Cumberland Psychiatric Hospital. Evie's mother, the child, admitted six years beforehand, walking across Either, Evie mothers a child admitted six years beforehand, walking across the vast expanse of barren grass, a nurse keeping her company and pressing the code buttons at the entrance door, Jarrett dancing up and down with excitement, watching all the time from the veranda. Mummy, she calls, her round face alight with joy, as Evie cuddles her and brushes her hair. Jarrett's real mother never visits. Evie's mother died when she was 14. Her sister, two weeks later, she'd been admitted to Cumberland, clothed in a straitjacket because she couldn't stop crying. I met Evie when she was 64. It's unfair, Nikki calls. What do we do, Robin? They tell me that I'm going to be sent south somewhere. I won't be able to see Dory from there. I'll lose her. You won't have her concerts anymore. And he shuffles towards the piano, sits at the piano stool and begins to play Schubert's unfinished symphony number. His fingers move expertly across the octaves, plaintive notes and glissandos, suddenly crashing in a cacophony of discords. The fat woman rolls from the lounge and stands beside him, patting him on the shoulder. She opens her mouth and sings in a strong, trained soprano. One fine day, I'll find you, from the opera Madame Butterfly. Her voice carries over the top of the subdued music and she's rubbing his shoulder as she sings. That's beautiful, Dolly. Isn't it beautiful, Frank? Evie stands to her feet and begins a toneless chant. Frank looks up from the fold of his grey coat and shakes his fist. Shut up, the lot of you, you wars. Don't you see we're being kicked out? Can't you see nobody cares that if we split up, we've got no one? Where am I going? They haven't told me that. And where's Dory to go and Marge? What are they going to do with us? Where's Marjorie, I ask. In bed, she's got depression, doesn't want to leave here. Frank slumps, slumps back in the chair, turns the switch on the radio, listening to the sounds of a commentator, hysterical as he calls the final lap in Harold Park. Dory, the fat lady, stops her singing, raises her finger to her lips. Shush, Frank, we don't want sister to hear. Turn off the radio, this is visiting hours. We're meant to be entertaining our visitor. I think we went, to, we went to the new place the other day when sister took us on a bus trip. Don't you remember? We were going to Summer Hill. Frank pulls the radio cord from the wall and snorts. 
Yeah, but we won't be together. We'll all be split up. Marjorie's going to live with her sister, and the sister's a witch. Dory shakes her head and lowers her voice, slowing the veils and sliding the words like syrup. It's okay. It needn't be bad. Just a little bit more. <laughs> sure, you'll, you'll feel better if we give our visitor a sing song. Let's sing. We all feel better when we sing. So she holds out her hand, pulling him from the chair to stand beside her, and sings. There'll be bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover. The words sound pure and true, and her song works a spell so that Mickey places his right hand back on the white piano keys and runs through the melody, adding baritone harmony. It's my favourite song, Dory, you know that? My mother used to sing that song, Frank whispers, his craggy face melting and softening as Dory continues to sing. There'll be love and laughter and life forever after. And Evie's monotone adds its own meld of magic and they all hear from down the hall the sound of another voice as Marjorie joins in. Tomorrow, just you wait and see. <laughs>